So here is the first theoretical tool, the state variable model in all its glory. And I really want to do two things as I take you through how this theoretical tool works. And that is firstly to explain how it works, what its mechanisms are, what its basic functioning is, how you can actually take a look at this model that I have in front of us and understand what its basic operating principles are. But once I've done that, I really then want to specify why I've chosen the variables that I have over here at selection, sequencing and placing and go on to how they hang together. Because you don't just choose any variables in education, you choose key variables and the variables that you choose should work together in certain ways. And the same thing with the states. You can see that the states I've kept the same throughout. They're open and solid states. And I'd want to talk a little bit about why I've chosen those states and why I think they're important. But before we get into that, let's take a look at how the model itself actually works. And let's start off at the bottom and we'll read it from bottom to top. And we can see that we have selection as the variable and the teacher in terms of that can have a choice between an open state and a solid state. And basically an open state would be a situation where she allows a lots, lots of flexibility and openness in terms of what the selection is. And a solid state would be a situation where what is to be done is definitely chosen and that's what is going to be done. Now, once that's decided upon, you can see that we move on to the second variable, which is sequencing. And you can see that there are paths running through from selection to sequencing. So a teacher that chooses an open selection process, when they move on to sequencing, they can choose open and solid states again. And just so with a teacher who chooses a solid state, that teacher can also, when getting to sequencing, choose at that point to be either open or solid. But by sequencing, we really mean the order in which the knowledge that was chosen to be done gets done. So first you do this, then you do that, then you do this activity, then you do that activity, then you do an assessment, and there could be various ways of sequencing the lesson itself. Now certain teachers will, for certain lessons, feel that that lesson should be solid in terms of the way the sequencing is done. And by that we mean one sequence that you follow from beginning to end, and that's the sequence that you use. A more open sequencing state would be a teacher, again, that is flexible and open to what the possible sequences could be with an understanding that maybe the sequence will go this way, maybe it'll go that way. Depending on this, the teacher could do that. Depending on what happens here, you could do that. So you have a situation where you have a whole variety of ways of actually doing the lesson opening up. Now, once that's decided upon, the teacher also has to work out the pacing of the lesson. The teacher has to work out how much time to spend on the different tasks and activities that are in that lesson itself. And the teacher there could choose to be open in terms of the pacing. In other words, to be flexible and say, well, if it's going hard and the kids aren't understanding it, well, we'll just open out the time a little bit. We'll take longer. If certain kids aren't understanding, we'll step back a little bit and we'll take a bit of a breather. Other teachers will be in a more solid state of pacing and that solid state will be this is how we have to do the timing of the lesson. Here it is. You've got the 10 minutes. Go with no negotiation in the time itself. Now, the first key thing that I want to say about these three variables and how they're operating is that a teacher who chooses an open selection state, for example, can then choose a solid sequencing state and a solid pacing state. A teacher that chooses a solid selection state could then be quite able to choose an open or solid sequencing state or an open or solid pacing state. Just because you've chosen one state at the beginning doesn't mean that that is the state for every single other variable that you're working with. And it's that core thing that gives the beauty of this model. It enables you to break out of a kind of a thinking where you get stuck in this teacher-centered, learner-centered situation where, for example, if the teacher is teacher-centered, then what happens is the selection variable is solid and the sequencing variable is solid and the pacing variable is solid because that's teacher-centered education. The teacher is in control of everything. And then you get this learner-centered education where everything's open and everything's flexible. The teacher allows choice about what's to be done. The teacher allows choice about the sequencing and the teacher allows choice about the pacing. And you land up in a situation where you have these two extremes, 
Whereas really in education, the fascination lies in the combinations that are between that, the variations that are working. A teacher who says, no, hold on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one type of lesson which I'm doing in terms of the selection of the stuff which we're doing, but I'm going to allow the kids to experiment with different kinds of sequences in their own time. So there you can hear a situation where the teacher has been solid in terms of the selection, but open in terms of the sequencing and open in terms of the pacing. That's exciting to me. It means that what you're starting to do is you're starting to understand that education is far more complex than those simplified binaries between teacher-centered and learner-centered education and the stupid fights we get into about which one's better. And certainly in a lot of teacher education programs where we land up pushing either one way or the other way, we want to get out of that type of uh, thinking. And the reason why I do this model first is because I feel it breaks you out of that mode. So let's just kind of stay with it a little bit and interrogate the diagram. And if you look closely into the diagram, what you'll start to see is that I've got arrows running through it. And right in the selection variable, you'll see that there's actually eight lines that start off there. And what we have to do when we read the model is we have to take each line, we've got to track it all the way from the bottom to the top. And you'll see if we start on the far left, We'll see we have a teacher who chooses an open selection and then also chooses an open sequence and then also chooses an open pacing. So you land up with a situation where all three variables are open. Now let's take the opposite extreme. If we move to the far right, what you can see over there is you can see a teacher who's chosen a solid state in terms of selection, a solid state in terms of sequencing and a solid state in terms of pacing. So there you have the two options. But in between those two extremes are six other options, which are very, very interesting in the way that they operate. So let's do some examples of these other six options that we have. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe educational situation. And then you see if you can work out what the coding of the selection, sequencing and pacing is. And let's start off with a Japanese lesson and it's a science lesson and the teacher sets up a whole bunch of chemicals she goes in beforehand and she sets the chemicals up in different places for the kids to work she knows exactly what the kids are supposed to do in terms of what the lesson outcomes are supposed to do but very interestingly what she does is when she gets the kids inside the classroom she says to them that they have to work out through experimenting with the chemicals what the exact combination is that she's looking for. So she in no ways tells them what the correct sequence is. They themselves have to go along in their own groups and they have to experiment with the chemicals and pour them in in this mixture and that mixture to work out what the correct combination is that's being looked for. The other thing that the teacher says to them is she puts them under a very strict time uh, routine where she insists that if they don't get it in the 10 minutes that's given, then they don't have any more time to actually experiment with that, putting the kids under pressure to really work as hard as they can. Now, that's a brilliant example of a kind of a lesson which isn't stuck in a teacher-centered or a learner-centered paradigm, but combines the two in highly effective ways. And here's a second example. Now this is taken from a art class and in the art class what happens is it's a drawing class and the teacher walks into the class and she makes sure that all the class has got lots and lots of paper and a really nice pencil to work with. She sets up the lesson by saying to the kids that what they're going to do is draw within a very limited time. Only a minute is given. But what happens is each time they've got to draw something, the kids themselves have got total control. One of the kids can shout out and say, we want to draw this. And then the, the kid points to that. So, for example, the kid says, we want to draw that chair. And then what happens is everyone has a minute and they've got to draw the chair. And then at the end of the minute, the teacher calls the time and says, OK, that's it. And then she looks around to see which other kid will want to choose any other thing. And the kid will say, let's draw the light. And then everyone looks at the light and then they know they've got a minute to draw. And what happens is the teacher is trying to ensure that the kids start to draw in an uninhibited, intuitive way. And I think that's a brilliant example of a second kind of a lesson which combines both open 
and solid variables in terms of teaching. So if we go back and we take a look at those two examples, what we'll see is that with the first example, the Japanese example, we have a situation where the teacher is in control of the content, so the selection variable is solid. But what happens then is the teacher allows the sequencing of the lesson itself to become really open. It's the kids who are allowed at that point to try and work out what sequence is right. She doesn't tell them what the sequence is that they've got to work with. They can experiment with it in an open way to try and find out what the answer is. The third thing which is quite interesting about that uh, lesson is the pacing variable where what she does is she puts them under very tight pacing requirements to put them under pressure to make sure that things get done uh, in an excited, intense kind of a way. Now with the second example, the art drawing example, well there we've got an interesting situation where the teacher actually isn't very much in charge of the selection of the content at all. In fact, it's the kids who are continuously choosing what it is that they're going to be drawing in the lesson itself. And also, the kids are actually in charge of the sequencing because it goes from one object to another object in terms of what they draw, which hasn't been decided on before. It's totally flexible. But what actually is really tight in terms of the way it works is the pacing variable where she gives a very strict limitation of one minute or sometimes two minutes for the kids to draw it as quickly and as um, intuitively as they can. So there we have the basics of the first theoretical model I want to introduce you to and I hope you can see why I've chosen this model to start with. It introduces you into the variety of educational processes that get you out of that bog-standard, teacher-centered, learner-centered type of analysis in education and opens you out to what the possibilities in education are across the world, the rich, enormously interesting um, varieties that are out there. In later videos, I definitely will be doing more examples so that you can get insight into what the other types of education are. Um, but what I'd like to do in the next video is introduce you into the regulative principles behind education, the ethical core of why we do education, and that contested space where different people and different ethical principles really compete against each other for what is most valuable in education.